the more important our arguments seem to be. It's just like we can just hold on to those things. And some people argue about, um, like, theology. Some people argue about politics. Some people just like to argue. You know what I find when I argue? I find that I'm actually trying to mask a, a place of insecurity. I'm pushing back where I feel pushed upon. And maybe the person I'm talking to doesn't mean to push up on me, but I'm not totally secure in where I stand, so I try to, I try to outdo them. It's been a long time since I've done that, but when I was in college, I used to really, really, really do it all the time because my, my major was English, and so the big thing about when you get an English degree, you do nothing but write all the time. So my, my professors, rather, rather than only testing me on my ability to write, they couldn't care less how creative and descriptive I was. What they wanted to know is, can you form a logical um, argument and can you, can you present it airtight to me? They basically wanted to know that I could think critically. So every single class, they would ask me to write papers, and it would be papers about you know, really relatively meaningless things like Shakespearean plays and sonnets and things like that. But what they wanted to know is, can you support what you believe with facts? And so I had been trained for years and years and years to think critically. The whole thing was, can you think critically? And because of that, honestly, when people were talking to me, I could identify areas where they weren't thinking critically, but they were thinking emotionally. And I started to undervalue the role of emotions in people's intelligence. And I just became, it, was, it wasn't intentional, I didn't become like this on purpose, but it was because I was, that was valued in the context where I, where I was, right, where I was getting my degree, critical thinking was it. And I noticed that I just became, argue, I would argue about anything. I mean, just throw the bone out, you could bait me like that. And so, because I came to value arguing. It was weird, it became like a value in my life to argue. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know how that became, and I noticed that I just overall felt so uneasy all the time. And I remember one time we were in a season of fasting as a church. This is when we lived back in Baton Rouge, obviously, because I was still in college. And I was praying one day, like, God, tell me, you know, how should I fast? I'm going to fast um, for, these thir- for these 21 days. And the Lord really convicted me. He said, I want you to fast from giving your opinion. And I was like, what? <laughs> he said, I want you to fast for 40 days from giving your opinion, unless you are expressly asked, like in class, obviously, if they ask for your opinion, don't go, I'm fasting for my opinion, but um, I'm so spiritual, how do you like that? But he said, unless you need to do it for an assignment, when you're in a conversation with someone, or when you are in, I had gotten in the habit of like sitting in the, in the seat in my church and, and analyzing the, the thinking of my pastor and his, and his messages, and I would go back in the Bible while he was talking and, and try to dissect if he was his argument was bad. It had gotten really bad, and I didn't even realize how bad it had gotten. It was have, in my mind, I was having Rose Pastor for lunch every after, afternoon on Sunday. Because it was just a wrong attitude. I started to value the wrong thing. I started to value my intelligence over my heart. And, you know, it doesn't matter how smart you are if you're a jerk. <laughs> and that's what I was becoming. And so <laughs> it was an ugly thing. So the Lord, he really dealt with me. He said, I want you to fast from giving your opinion for... 40 days, and when people ask you specifically for advice or your opinion, only give them what the Bible says. Don't give them your opinion. Go to the Bible, look it up, and say, this is what the Bible says, and then let them work it out. You know what was was staggering to me over those 40 days was how often I offered my flesh and my opinions and my own convictions and my own thoughts to people as just the solution for their problems or the right thing and not the word of God. My default was my opinions and what I thought was good and what I thought was right. And it was not necessarily always based on the word of God or necessarily always accurate. Sometimes it, it led people down the way of, of my convictions and my, my opinions that didn't lead people to, to Jesus. And I started realizing like, wow, I really, a lot of the stuff that comes out of my mouth is just me. And that's not good. <laughs> I can do better with my words than this. It doesn't bring peace. And that really changed the way that my default mode, it was a good, like it was a reset. It changed my default mode. It made me think all the time, I need to filter things through the word of God. And I don't need to put burdens on people that are too hard for them to bear that I don't want to bear myself. That's a very self-righteous way to be. And so God really did a great change in me. So I, I, I was able to quit valuing being argumentative. You know, and so a tip for being argumentative, okay? We glorify God when we remain loving, even when we disagree with the views and values of others. Remember that it costs you absolutely nothing to respect someone's opinion. That's a good thing. It doesn't cost me anything just to shut up. It really, really doesn't. Just just be quiet. Respect someone's opinion. It doesn't hurt me. It doesn't hurt them. It's good. It builds things. Look in verse in uh, 2 Timothy 
verse two, um, chapter 2, verses 22 through 25. I want to read this. This is a great verse if you're in leadership of any, of any way. If you aspire to be in leadership, this is a great way to prepare. Sometimes the best way to prepare for leadership is just to prepare your heart. And this is a great way to prepare your heart for leadership. It says this, looking in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 22 through 25, it says this. Where is it? I really should be wearing reading glasses, but I'm not. I'm not resisting as long as I can. Here it says, it says, now he's, Paul is talking to Timothy. He's pastoring a church. He's a young man. And Paul says, now flee from youth, youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart, but refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels, or another word for quarrels is arguments. He says, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome or argumentative is another way to say it, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient with, when wronged, and with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of truth. So Paul doesn't say that you should just go along with the flow. He says, but don't do things that you know are going to bring arguments up in your life over issues, over past offenses, over different opinions about things just don't engage those things and let kindness be the rule when we speak he says you can't the the servant of God shouldn't be quarrelsome shouldn't be argumentative but you should be kind and gentle able to teach patient when wronged so able to teach is a component but it needs to be surrounded by kindness and gentleness and patience that is how that's the casing that we put our arguments or our abilities in. we put it in the casing of kindness, gentleness, and patience. And that's a good rule of thumb to remember whenever we have that, whenever we are at difference in our friendships or with our team members or with our families, that whatever the difference is, we need to encase our comments, encase our feedback in gentleness, kindness, and patience. Because in doing so, actually that helps us grow. We can actually become better people when we take care to love people by pointing out areas where they need to grow. And it's not that we don't point things out for people. It's just that we encase those things in gentleness, kindness, love and patience, right? So that's good. That's good to know. All right, so um, <clears throat> moving on to harsh. We avoid, when we want to bring, bring peacemakers, be peacemakers, we avoid harsh speaking. Well, that's easy to know. Avoid harsh speaking. That does not stir up peace. The Bible says, one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite verses is in the Bible is, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but fierce words stir up anger, or harsh words stir up anger. And it's, whenever we feel assaulted or wronged or people you know people sometimes most of the time I would guess that most of you are not the initiator of harsh words you know I would think that most of the women in this room I believe that you're not the one that go into a situation and bring harsh words with you but sometimes we can just be affronted with harsh words we can definitely be the recipients of harsh words in fact last night I was at this thing with um Annabelle a dance a dance little performance with Annabelle that she and her little team did at a at a place down in San Marco and um it was really poorly organized, and it was very um, just, I don't know, one of those things. You know, as a mom, sometimes you could do stuff, and you're like, why did I tell my kid they could do this? It's the biggest waste of time. <laughs> I was already a little bit just kind of aggravated. I had just come in the night before. I was behind at work. I really didn't want to do it, and I'm already there. And they were trying to get these little, these dancers, this tiny little room, and we have like 40 dancers on Annabelle's team, and then all their moms came. So it's like 40 dancers and all their moms, like 80 people in this tiny little aerobic studio, basically, like this fitness studio. And they're trying to put us all through. And one of the ladies was, we were all like grown women. Look at me, grown woman. We're walking through. She's going, shoo, 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 shooing us. Now look, shooing me. I was going, what are you doing? Don't shoo me. I mean, like, it was like, I'm already here. It took me, like, we're going to dance for three minutes. I've spent three hours on this tonight to see my kid dance for three minutes. I'm already aggravated. This is not organized. Now you're shooing me for real? You know? There was something in me I wanted to just, like, bow up at her. I mean, she was just, she just caught me at the wrong time. But, thank the Lord, I didn't. By his grace, I just was like, yes, I'm moving through as quickly as I can. Thank you for your direction. I appreciate it. But you, you know, when, when people use harsh words with us, 